afternoon and welcome to this, our historic Riggs Library on this beautiful afternoon. My name is Tom Banchoff. I serve as Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and as Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And on behalf of the Center and our co-sponsors, the Georgetown Global Health Institute and the African Studies Program, I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's event, Sant'Egidio's Dream, How a People's Movement is Meeting the Challenge of AIDS in Africa and Shaping the Future of Global Health. And by now you should know this is not just a panel discussion, it's also a celebration that has brought us here together around this new book, Sant'Egidio's Dream, which really tells a, a remarkable story. Just a few words of, of background before I turn it over to my colleague, Paul Eli. Uh, Sant'Egidio, as I think most all of you know, uh, is a Catholic lay community that traces its origins to the student movement in Rome in the late 1960s. For more than five decades, Sant'Egidio has been a powerful advocate, not just advocate, but also actor on behalf of poor and marginalized communities in Rome and from Rome around the world. The community's also had a transformative impact as a promoter of peaceful conflict resolution and interreligious dialogue on a global scale. Sant'Egidio and Georgetown have a long history, a decades long history of collaboration and friendship really uh, around a range of activities. I just want to mention one highlight which some of you will remember. Back in 2006, the Sant'Egidio Prayer for Peace was held here on campus. The background there was that in the years since the historic gathering that John Paul II brought together in Assisi, a huge interfaith gathering, uh, the community, Sant'Egidio, has organized a major international meeting on an annual basis. It's only been held in the U.S. once so far, so far, and we're delighted to have hosted it here. And we're grateful to have so many members of the community with us this afternoon. I want to call out in particular Andrea Bartoli, president of the Sant'Egidio Foundation for Peace and Dialogue. Thank you, and thank you all for, for joining us. The focus of today's event is, of course, the Dream Project, which began back in 2002 with the development and implementation of an innovative therapy program in Mozambique, enabling people who are HIV positive to survive and to thrive. Sant'Egidio's Dream, just published with Georgetown University Press, also proud to emphasize, tells the story of the program, which has since expanded to 10 countries in Africa and helped some eight million patients. At the Berkeley Center here at Georgetown, a Catholic and Jesuit university, much of our research, teaching, and outreach is designed to understand and promote innovative efforts to bring religious communities and diverse partners together around global challenges. It's hard to imagine, at least hard for me to imagine, a success story more striking and more significant than Santa Gidio's vital and ongoing work around the AIDS crisis. We are especially grateful, and I can't see you, but I know you're there, to the author of Sant'Egidio's Dream, Roberto Morozzo de la Roca, professor of modern history at the University of Roma Tre, for joining us today. Give him a hand. We're also delighted to have a friend of Georgetown, Mario Marazziti, with us, a former Italian parliamentarian who has taken key roles in Sant'Egidio's humanitarian efforts worldwide. Give him a hand, too. Yeah. And two colleagues from the Berkeley Center, Catherine Marshall, Berkeley Center senior fellow with decades of experience at Georgetown, but also working in Africa in development work. What a generous crowd. This is great. Um, and finally, it's my pleasure to turn things over to my colleague, Paul Eli, also a Berkeley Center senior fellow and a longtime friend to Sant'Egidio, who wrote the books afterward and will moderate our conversation. So please join me in welcoming Paul and our panel. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you uh, to Georgetown University Press, to Al Bertrand and Stephanie Rojas and others for, for publishing the book and making this event possible. It's uh, really powerful to see so many uh, friends here. I think just speaking extempore and for myself, that 
I don't have any a deeper experience of friendship in adulthood than the experience I have had through the community of Santa Gidio. It's a continual unfolding of what, what sh friendship means, what it is and, and what it does and what it can become. And I'm so grateful to so many of you for that. I'm also grateful to have had the opportunity to introduce uh, this panel and to write the afterword uh, to Santa Gidio's dream. My experience of the community of Santa Gidio is rooted especially in fairly regular visits to Rome and to Trastevere. So as I've spent time at the prayer and with members of the community and out and about in Trastevere, for years I would hear about this work in Africa, the um, testimony of people who had just returned or people who were making a plan for what was next in the dream program. But it wasn't until this uh, book arrived in Italian and we had the opportunity to publish it that um, I was able to learn in greater detail what just what the community has achieved over these years. And so the book was for me an act of education and self-education. Much of what I learned, uh, you know, you already know or will, will emerge in our conversation, but just to give a kind of gazetteer of, of the dream program, um, it's now present in 10 countries Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, the Central African Republic, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea, and Swaziland, as well as Mozambique, where it originated. It's treated more than half a million people, has seen patients in more than 8 million visits to 50 clinics, has performed more than 400,000 regu regular laboratory tests, has developed about 500 full-time staff, all of them Africans, has trained some 15,000 people as healthcare volunteers, through its treatment, about 200,000 babies born to HIV-positive mothers have emerged free of the virus. Over the past 20 years, the mortality of people with HIV in the countries where DREAM operates has decreased from 313 of every 100,000 inhabitants to 224. Average male life expectancy has increased from 47 years to 58, and that of females from 52 to 64. Meanwhile, other activist groups have taken the treatment approach elsewhere and have seen similar outcomes. That's what friendship can do, <laughs> amazing. Now, the people on the panel today ha have lived this and have done it, and so I'm now gonna turn to them um, t to learn more for myself about uh, how this came about. First, to Roberto Morazzo della Rocca, thank you so much for writing the book and then for traveling uh, here um, to speak on its behalf. Thank you. Why this book? Uh, what, what origin does it have? Uh, was it a necessary book on an ignored topic or something else? Uh, uh, before I answer, uh, I would like to thank, to thank uh, Georgetown University for this invitation to here to Washington. Uh, particularly, I would like uh, 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 to thank uh, do, you, Paul, uh, you worked uh, a lot of time about, on this book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Also, my gratitude is to, to the Georgetown University Press for publishing my book on the history of AIDS in Africa in such a beautiful and uh, elegant way. Thank you so much uh, to you all uh, you are, uh, that are here. Uh, but uh, now, uh, please, before I answer, please uh, uh, understand, uh, forgive my English. It is not, <laughs> please, thank you. Uh, the triple antiretroviral therapy, which was finally successful in treating the, the virus, the HIV, uh, started being administered, admi administered in the West in 1996. However, it only reached Africa many years later and only became accessible for everyone who needed it there uh, 15 years uh, uh, later. Millions of people died because of this double standard of health care. Uh, my friend in Sant'Egidio, who were the first to test programs to treat AIDS in Africa with antiretroviral drugs in uh, 2001, c 
came up against the enormous obstacles and the resistance. All the major international healthcare agencies considered it wrong to take the therapy to Africa. It was like a dogma. It was not possible to treat people in Africa. According to the data of the year 2000, only 4% of the 36 million people with uh, HIV lived in uh, Western countries. And they were the only people who received uh, the antiretroviral therapies. These therapies were not available for people living in uh, developing countries. In addition, 70% of the uh, 36 million people with uh, HIV were Africans. And the eight countries in the world where the prevalence rates of the epidemic were above 20% uh, above of the population were all in Africa. This is the, the ground <laughs> because this book was necessary about uh, this problem of double standard. I think. What was the reason for the double standard? What was behind it at that time? Uh, the reason, uh, we can say reason, but uh, more convenient, convenience, uh, perhaps. Uh, convenience. convenience. Uh, uh, the drugs were too expensive for the Africans. Uh, people in Africa uh, were unable to comply with and uh, follow the strict uh, <laughs> regimen involved the, uh, in taking uh, the antiretrovirals uh, every day for several years. This was too complicated. Anyway. Too complicated for the sample African to sample. So this was the common thinking. Uh, the common thinking, yes, of the. Uh, Prevention uh, with uh, campaigns based uh, on the use of the condom uh, and uh, on, making, uh, on making people terrified of AIDS uh, was the, the common thinking always. was well, the best way to counter the disease. And cost effectiveness uh, studies uh, showed an enormous advantage of prevention over treatment in Africa. The, the, this the studies of uh, this time, but uh, the other studies after uh, uh, told the op opposite. <laughs> uh, and the doctors from Sant'Egidio, who were treating AIDS in Europe, uh, before in Africa, in Europe, because uh, there is a uh, history, uh, with uh, the triple antiretroviral cocktail, uh, and uh, who knew the sub-Saharan countries so well, uh, uh, rebelled against uh, this uh, Afro-pessimism. Uh, they believed uh, that the various reasons for the denying treatment to the Africans were completely unfounded. Uh, they saw that uh, if AIDS uh, patients were treated, they stopped being contagious. Wasn't this the, was, wasn't, uh, this the best form of prevention? Uh, that this uh, treating and preventing was the same thing, not uh, two opposite options, as the common thinking uh, uh, say. The information campaigns in Africa, based on uh, spreading uh, the fear of AIDS, created a terrible stigma for seropositive uh, people. And uh, this uh, was why nobody did the test to, found, to find out uh, whether they were positive and continued spreading the virus in their everyday life. What uh, would be the point of knowing uh, that uh, you were HIV positive if you could not be treated? Uh, you would just be excluded from society, from the village, from the family from your family, and in fact, many of the very limited number of people who took the test committed suicide when they found out they were HIV positive. If the treatment had been available, they would have gone and had the test and then have been saved by the triple therapy. Uh, the drugs were expensive. It is a reason. At the time. 
the, the, the branded uh, drugs. Uh, but then there were the generic drugs. The pharmaceutical companies defended the, their lucrative patents, but, but by then, countries like India and Brazil were producing vast quantities of generic drugs and refused to comply with the international rules in the name of a health emergency. Besides, the Africans would have never been able to pay for branded drugs. Without the treatment with the generic drugs, they would have simply died. They would not have increased, the, uh, anyway, the re revenues of the big pharmaceutical companies. Condoms. Condoms were preventive, it's true. But most Africans did not use them because they were not part of their culture. The international agencies purchased and distributed billions of them, billions of them, but uh, this had uh, not real effect. Year after year, there was an exponential increase in the number of HIV-positive Africans. On the other hand, the Africans really wanted antiretroviral drugs. Some studies soon showed that they were more compliant than Western HIV-positive people who were richer and better educated, but also more selfish and uh, unruly. Cost, <laughs> I think it was so. Uh, cost effectiveness was an important issue. Uh, preventions, prevention was very cheap condoms and the propaganda campaigns saying uh, AIDS kills, AIDS kills, were inexpensive and easy to sustain. However, they were quite totally ineffective, practically. practically. Some African countries like Botswana or Zimbabwe had, had reached rates of nearly 40% HIV positive people at the beginning of the year 2000. Uh, all these people were without treatment inevitably going to die. The treatment was expensive, but some serious economic analysis, very few at the beginning, were going in the opposite direction uh, from that believed uh, by those who were in favor of prevention rather than therapy. Even uh, in uh, 2002, The Lancet of London uh, published an article that supported the thesis that prevention with condoms alone would be 28 times more advantageous in terms of cost effectiveness than treatment. Uh, than the antiretroviral therapies. In contrast, uh, uh, 14 years later, in uh, 2016, the United Nations published a paper in which the investments in therapies produced a 17-fold economic return, unlike that of prevention. Tot totally the op opposite. This, is, this was the, the, the situation uh, at, at that time. It's a good, good reason to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in effect, that's the story of the book. 15 years, a pro profound change in the view of what should be done about AIDS and something actually being done about it. What brought about this change? How did it come about? Uh, but. Uh, My point of view is uh, always for of Sant'Egidio. And Sant'Egidio, according to Sant'Egidio Fruth, it appeared obvious that uh, saving people from AIDS meant giving the workers back to their countries. Uh, because the, uh, the people who wanted only prevention uh, didn't think to the people who died. Uh, uh, but it, it was the problem. 
that the, the society had uh, no, no more workers. <laughs> the breadwinners uh, uh, should back, uh, come back to their family and, uh, and the society in general needed uh, uh, trust in, uh, in the future. The, per the therapies uh, uh, were necessary. Uh, the therapies were uh, expensive, uh, uh, even using uh, generic drugs, but uh, generic drugs always far less so than uh, with uh, branded drugs. And the benefits were twofold. People uh, didn't uh, die anymore and they were no longer infectious. Uh, the best prevention, the, the therapies. Uh, moreover, in the programs, uh, no, I would say something more about Sant'Egidio. Sant'Egidio set up uh, centers uh, spread across the territories, uh, trained uh, local staff of medical doctors, uh, nurses, uh, uh, biologists, uh, lab technicians, uh, and activists who supported the patients uh, on treatment to improve the adherence. Uh, Sant'Egidio purchase the, the generic drums, drugs uh, in India. Eh? Uh, this was the, 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 the program of uh, uh, Sant'Egidio. Moreover, the programs of Sant'Egidio uh, um, uh, set up to fight AIDS. Uh, uh, in these programs, uh, a great deal of attention was given to pregnant women in order to prevent the virus from passing from the mother to, to, to her child during the pregnancy or at the delivery. Uh, this way, the mothers, who were often victim of uh, men's uh, careless behavior, were saved and their children didn't become HIV positive. Uh, when people started uh, seeing the physical resurrection of sick people who had been uh, given up for dead, uh, they were able to trust the therapy. This was the change. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, seeing uh, the resurrection of uh, a lot of people. Uh, and uh, so all the people began uh, to accept, uh, uh, to do the test because they knew they could be treated and saved. Scusate, sorry, I'm a little partisan, but I think it, it was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. And you, 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 um, this did not happen, it wasn't done by Sant'Egidio alone. Other organizations took part. Uh, how did that yes. come about? Yes. Uh, okay, Sant'Egidio according to me, is to be credited with having fought for the therapy for Africa and the with, with the standards of excellence. Uh, but uh, he was uh, supported uh, by other people uh, a quarter of a century before uh, today. Uh, other people who opposed the mainstream uh, denial of the treatment. Uh, I can think, uh, for uh, example, uh, to Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Kofi Annan, uh, uh, Job Lang, uh, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland uh, uh, of the WHO, uh, Stephen Lewis, uh, uh, Canadian uh, in the nation, United Nations. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the other politicians, uh, scientists, uh, experts believed that uh, uh, not treating people with AIDS in Africa was the right thing uh, to do. International cooperation at the time, uh, as a whole, shared this opinion. The same holds, holds true for UNAIDS, the United Nations Organization set up uh, in 1995. This agency was put in charge of the fight against AIDS throughout the world. And uh, as a result, 
the World Health Organization, Organization was no longer responsible for dealing with AIDS. The, this is an important point, I think, to understand the history. The organizers of UNAIDS had carried out a wrong political operation that aimed to sideline the WHO and discredit, discredit the medical approach to AIDS. They claimed that the fight against AIDS was to be carried out with a multi-sectorial approach at a sociological, cultural, educational, and not mainly medical level, as the WHO would have done. In order to deal with the epidemic, uh, rather than the therapies, what was needed for UNAIDS was to act on the social causes. This approach would have required nothing less than a radical transformation of the whole world, <laughs> an undertaking that uh, would have continued for decades or even hundreds of years, uh, but uh, the people died. And instead uh, of this uh, utopia, a race against time had to happen in order to save tens of millions of HIV positive people and to stop them from being contagious. Uh, I will stop here, but the, the Sant'Egidio model, called the dream uh, drug resource uh, enhancement against AIDS and malnutrition, has been uh, successful and uh, has been replicated in many African countries. Uh, both uh, with its uh, treatment protocols and its uh, diagnostic. Uh, uh, but uh, there was, uh, yeah, Sant'Egidio was not alone. There was a, a general change around uh, 2003, 2004, or five. Uh, uh, the WHO recovered its responsibility for dealing with AIDS after having been overshadowed by UNAIDS. Uh, the big institution and the foundation realized that a treatment was necessary and they provided the funds. I am thinking uh, of the World Bank, uh, uh, the Global Fund, uh, the PEPFAR, and various foundations in particular in the United States. AIDS uh, has not yet disappeared. The vaccine uh, that was announced a uh, hundred times uh, does not <laughs> yet exist. Uh, but uh, HIV positive people everywhere can survive like anyone else, as long as they remember to take uh, each day their medication, even in Africa today. So, thank you. Thank you. And I want to turn shortly to how DREAM fits into the community of Sant'Egidio broadly, but first, following on what you just said, I would like to turn to Catherine Marshall. Now, Catherine, when you and I were speaking a little earlier today, you said that there was a real turning point in the approach to AIDS in Africa, and the cultural historian in me pricked up my ears because uh, I, I know how Turning points are a dime a dozen in, in the world of uh, contemporary history. But when someone with your authority, you come from the World Bank and also from a world uh, uh, scholarly approach to development, when you say that a real turning point uh, existed, I, uh, I'm, I'm counting, it, counting it as significant. So what was that turning point and what brought it about? Well, first, maybe I should say why, why I'm sitting here, uh, that I played a bit part in this whole operation. Um, I was uh, in the World Bank uh, with a, a new challenge, uh, which was to try to engage religious communities uh, more directly in development work and in the dialogue. And the president, Jim Wolfenson, was very much enchanted by the community of Sant'Egidio, particularly coming out of the work in the Balt Balkans. So he was very committed and had an extensive set of relationships and dialogue. And so the community basically came to him 
uh, and said, we want money to finance this operation. And Wolfenson turned to me and said, make it happen. Um, <laughs> The difficulty was, there were a number of difficulties, which I think do relate to this turning point. Um, the, the first was that you had a lot of governments at this point who were still very much in denial on the HIV AIDS crisis. And that would include the Mozambique authorities, but a number of others. I still remember at some meeting, um, Bill Clinton said, you know, denial is not a river in Egypt. Um, basically, there was this really very strong hesitation about getting involved, and it was only in many ways when many of the relatives of heads of state started to die uh, that you started to get a real awareness of, of a disease that was affecting in the epicenter a third of the population. I mean, one in three people had a death sentence uh, in that dark time. Uh, so I think the there are a number of, of important turning points that, that were part of this story of the way the World Bank got involved, which was, was to uh, finance an operation. But it did require first, uh, it really highlighted the skepticism of so many people in the development world towards religious organization. Yeah. Uh, you know, why? Why would we be supporting the community of Sant'Egidio? Um, <laughs> I think, though, what the community did, as I see the major part of the contribution, was to argue forcefully that people in Mozambique had a right to the same quality of care that people in Italy, and that children who were born in Mozambique <coughs> had as much right to be born when there was knowledge and there were there were drugs. Uh, they were as um, as had as much right. It was a question of rights uh, to to have the same level of treatment. And and this community lived that out in ways that people who were pinching pennies simply could not. They they were determined to demonstrate that it was as feasible to have. Um, a quality program with quality results in Mozambique as it was in Rome. And I think that was one of the major turning points. I mean, there were a couple of other important things. Another element that you didn't mention, the, the HIV is the only disease, as far as I understand it, where people living with the disease have formed an alliance to uh, advocate for everyone else living with the same disease. Um, and people living with AIDS is actually an acronym. P, um, but I think that that's been a very crucial point. And then we were in this transition period when, in the beginning, these drugs were hugely expensive. I mean, I think it was $10,000 a month. Or, and it was negotiations with the companies. It was pressure. It was all sorts of people, including Clinton and Bush and so on, getting involved from very high levels uh, that really brought the price down to levels that made it conceivable for people in the World Bank and in the Global Fund and in PEPFAR and so forth to be, to be able to conceive of treating millions of people. And then just one last issue that was, was a huge issue was that when people start taking uh, uh, it's for life. And somebody has to pay for it for the full, for, until someone dies. Because if they stop taking it, they, they will progress back into where they were. Uh, so the idea that there had to be a lifelong commitment um, was something that Wolfenson was prepared to take on. I'm not sure that his successors have fully fully grasp that, and, and does the US Congress fully grasp that by um, reauthorizing or by funding PEPFAR today, uh, they need to appreciate that this is a commitment to life. Uh, so, so those are some pieces of the story. Yes. Thank, thank you, and a lot of that I had not really understood even working 
elbow to elbow with you for almost 10 years. So I'm, I'm learning as we go, and I really appreciate uh, what, what you just spelled out, especially about the commission that you had from Wolfenson to, to, to step in. And obviously, you did it uh, with a palm. Mario, uh, one of the aspects of this story that amazes me is that at the time that Sant'Egidio began to work um, for the treatment of AIDS in Mozambique, the country was just coming off a terrible civil war, which had partly been mediated by the community. Uh, it's kind of like the influenza epidemic happening just after World War I. <laughs> you know, you've just had one bad thing happen, and here's another. But what emerges in the book is that that experience of involving yourselves with the people of Mozambique to mediate the civil war um, pre prepared the community to, uh, to, to take this next step let's say by um, making clear to your members that there was a way to oppose Afro-pessimism. Am I getting this right? Can you explain how, mm. how the one thing led to the other? But, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think that there is a deep relationship between uh, what Sant'Egidio uh, did in Mozambique before, before means between 90 and 92 uh, Sant'Egidio brokered the peace accord uh, that stopped a civil war with one million casualties and three million dislocated people, while being just Roman and Italians. Well, that is uh, the, final, the peace agreement was signed in Rome. Seventeen parties to the agreement, or some large number? No, no, no. Uh, it was easy. There were the guerrillas, the Renamo, and uh, the government that were Marxist-Leninist, the Frelimo. So only two sides was a little, uh, compared to now, uh, easier. <laughs> but uh, uh, the problem is that uh, there is the same route, uh, both uh, at the beginning of the dream program and uh, at the beginning of the uh, attempt to stop that war. Uh, it was not acceptable, exactly, that Mozambican people should die that way while we were in good health in Rome, or in Italy, or in Paris. Because uh, Sant'Egidio had been one of the first, uh, for the, the first Christian organization to enter Mozambique during the civil war that was killing whoever. And, uh, and then Sant'Egidio started to be rooted in that country and, uh, and to have people, communities, groups there. But our friends of Sant'Egidio there, some of them were killed by the civil war. But why, uh, if I go to, to my job, to just to have to my job place, I will not die, and he has to die. He's my brother, my sister. And then we started to think, how can we stop this massacre? And this is how Sant'Egidio was never involved in peacemaking we started to find the ways to find who the guerrilla war, uh, people were. And, so, and then the peace negotiation started, and it went on for 26 months, and the peace became possible. As for uh, even now, I think it is the only case of a major conflict in the world that was stopped by a non-governmental organization. And uh, with AIDS, we had the same problem. Why are they dying of AIDS? And we are living with AIDS. We are HIV infected. And why, uh, how is this possible that the world has decided a genocide if 30 million people are not treated, they will die sooner or later? And how can be accepted? If, it, if, it, if there is a truth that accepts a genocide as a normality, it is not a truth. It's a lie. And then, but we were substantially small to little and alone in that. But uh, the, 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 every person is a person. And this is the, the basic, not, of course, of Christianity, but also of democracy, of just being humans. And this is how we started to try to demonstrate that therapy was the real prevention and how the genocide could be stopped. 
uh, Catherine said uh, there was a lot of denial. Many states were in denial. I remember uh, in 2000, I think there was the, in Durban, there was the World Conference on AIDS. At that time, Tabo Mbeki was in denial. He was saying, we must fight against poverty because AIDS is a way of new colonization. And the Minister of Health of South Africa, the, a woman, unfortunately, uh, was saying that uh, AIDS could be uh, tackled by giving papaya and bananas. Uh, that was, but it was South Africa. It was not uh, the last country. It was just to, uh, Mandela was alive. So the immense power of uh, South Africa was playing a big role in that. Uh, I myself went to South Africa in 2003, I think, with uh, Pro Professor Guidotti and others, because in that moment, Nevirapin, the second, uh, the, the cocktail is three uh, principles. In that moment, there was the second uh, principle that was, the drug was by burning uh, Nevirapin, had some good results to prevent transmission from mother to child, but only by 50%. So uh, the situation was so tragic that it was something. But of course, uh, nevirapine was, um, was costing four, four euros, dollars, uh, four, four dollars. And of course, you can give spread nevirapine. But the result is that was that kids were still infected, mothers were still dying with the HIV. Then we went there to demonstrate that only with the triple therapy, and we have to to accept the principle that they need to have the same quality that we have. In Europe and America, we were not dying anymore. They were dying. That's it. So it was a long, uh, a long road because uh, in Mozambique, uh, we started there because we knew the country better. The second country was Malawi. We chose Malawi because it was smaller and because it was imploding because Malawi was at the time three, 13 million people. And we thought, we, had to, we demonstrated that the therapy is possible. Now we have to demonstrate that treating AIDS, we can create a future for that country. Because in that moment, if I remember well, uh, there were only four teachers left in the country. Uh, they were- for 30 million? Uh, 13 million people. And four teachers. Uh, yes, uh, they were going back from English to Chichewa. They were stopping to learn English. Uh, the first time I arrived in Blantyre, uh, the, the, from the airport to the center, the, the shops along the road, the most common shops were uh, for the rich people. Of course, they were sofas, a lot of uh, dust and sofas along the street. And uh, they were tombstones and coffins. Sofas, tombstone, coffins, sofas, for 20 kilometers. The, the country was imploding. And then we decided to t demonstrate that preventing mother to child, a new generation of newborn children without HIV, the mothers covered with the therapy could live and could live even after. Then the, after many years, we also the, the scientific team, not me, I say we, because I like <laughs> Santegidio, but I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and uh, the, the scientific team demonstrated that uh, the health organization should not stop giving the therapy after six months from the birth of the child, because this was, uh, uh, and not only to the sick people, but to everyone, because this was the largest way to be effective in prevention. And then in 2011, I think it entered in the world guidelines. So step by step, all the in intuitions of this program were uh, adopted by the international organization. But uh, the beginning was we must give the same thing that we have. This is the only way. And uh, what uh, Jeffrey Sachs says in the foreword is there, were, there was a moral stand. 
And I think it was a moral stand. So we cannot accept what is not acceptable. But then, and I want to conclude this, uh, the answer, but uh, now 500,000 people are in therapy in 10 countries. And 400,000 regular blood tests are um, in for the people in the program. There is the paradox that the children and also the mothers, the mortality of the children and the mothers inside the program is lower than the general mortality of children and mothers in Africa because they are taken care. And uh, the crucial thing is that uh, those who were marginalized and stigmatized, the women, has become the center of the program because uh, we have 30 main centers over 10 countries and some hundreds smaller centers because it is uh, uh, like a satellite uh, system and because there are also bands that go even to the rural areas. The problem is accessibility and proximity and the system is not just the center. It is to go and find the people and to find the compliance of the people that who are far. So it is a completely African model. But the center are, the, are women. Because when Roberto Morozzo said, uh, they started to see people who were resurrecting. I remember a woman, uh, Anna. Uh, she was less than 35 kilos. She was dying. And they had put her at the border of the village alone with the kids in a, in a, in a, in a hut. And the kids were uh, just uh, crying, and she had nothing, and she was dying. They did not know of what, for why she was dying, but she was dying. And she was so ugly that she was cursed, put aside, stigmatized. People from the program knew that, went there, and then gave her the therapy, and then she started to live. And then she came back to the, to the village after some months. And she was in good health. She was 60 kilos, something like that. And they thought that she was a ghost. <laughs> and then she said, sorry, touch me. <laughs> she was not a ghost. But this. Uh, all the directors of all the centers in the 10 countries are all women. And they have become the backbone of the therapy for the, for the, for the husbands, for the men, of, for the non-husbands. And they have become sort of a, a beginning of new democracy in a country where women were worth less than one sandal. And so this is, uh, and, but 500,000 people means also that everyone was a person one by one. Uh, it is not a massive program. It is that it started with 30 people in Matola laboratory, in the Matola place in, in the periphery of Maputo. Then there was a problem of money. It could not be raised the money because it, somehow it was, outlawed to give the therapy at the beginning. Why should I give money for something that is not in the guidelines? And then it was complicated even to raise the money. But step by step, it was created the model. And, uh, and then the money had to be raised also for the biomolecular laboratory, bi laboratories, not just to give the, the drugs, because minimalism mm -hmm is the other risk of the, our world towards Africa or towards the south of the world, to give drugs but without control because it is less expensive. But then at the end of the day, all this is, has become apparently uh, much more convenient, also cost effective than uh, many other things. But this is something that is possible if one person, and this is at Egidio, takes care of another person, not of 500,000 people. Everyone can do something. That's it.
I would like to ask uh, Professor Morazzo to answer a, a, a kind of final question that we can all speak to. Maybe you can translate it for him, Mario. But first, I would like to ask Catherine, um, you, what Mario just described, you witnessed uh, from a very different chair, a world of expertise. Uh, how, did, how did it look from, the, from where you sat to watch these uh, enlightened amateurs uh, move into the sphere of public health in, in the way that, um, that this book describes? What did it look like from your perspective, Catherine? Well, from where I was sitting, there were many people who were horrified by what was happening and by the projections uh, that were showing really quite a complete decline of a huge part of the world. Um, I know personally that I was one of not, not a small number of people within this sort of development community my assistant was Ugandan, and one by one, her family were dying. And there was no way to, at, the, at that point, there were not drugs, and it was a horrible death. Um, and one by one, um, people were, were dying, and so we were very determined to try to do whatever we could. And for that reason, seeing the community of Sant'Egidio with their with their inspiration and their stubbornness and their um, <laughs> commitment to making sure that nobody said no. You know, you say the impossible takes a long time. Um, I mean, the possible takes a long time, the impossible takes a little longer. So, so I think that we were certainly, Wolfenson was very receptive and so were a number of other people, but you also ran into you know, does it make sense to have these incredibly expensive drugs for a very small number of people when you could be um, having approaches that were broader and so forth? But I think there are two points that are worth making while I, so I don't forget them. I mean, the first one was that something that is now very much on our minds was, came out of this. The reason why HIV AIDS spread so fast in Mozambique was that people came back from the refugee camps in millions. There were people in um, Tanzania, Malawi, um, Zimbabwe, um, who were infected with AIDS, but, but you didn't have um, that uh, level um, during the conflict. The conflict, in many ways, protected people. So that it was a very vivid illustration that the problems of conflict are very closely related to health. Um, and the destruction of the health facilities um, was one of the, the casualties of the 30 years of war uh, in Mozambique. And the weakness of health systems was another uh, major issue. Um, I'm going to tell one other story. Um, uh, I was the country director for Southern Africa during the, the um, late 1990s. And uh, one of the questions that came up was, should we be talking about gender relations? And the, I, I sat next to the prime minister at the dinner, and he said, you know, we have other problems to deal with. Um, you know, relationships between men and women, talking about gender, strategy, women's empowerment, that is not our problem. Um, and I, when I am asked sometimes, what did I miss? Uh, in my career, that's one thing I think I missed um, because I accepted that this was not a priority. And the same prime minister, years later, sitting next to him, said, if we do not change relationships between men and women in our country, we have no future. Um, that the, those were fundamental issues in building a new society and a new country. And in many ways, that came out through this and so in the same way that now we're recognizing that climate and health cannot be disentangled, one of, the, one of the lessons from this is the degree to which the patterns of conflict and the causes and the response to health and services cannot be disentangled and need to be treated as part of the same. Yeah. Wow. You, you've already, that was the question I was about to ask. And you gave a triple answer. <laughs> the, what, what are some of the lessons of, uh, of the DREAM program for global health? And 
already you said the, the relationships between women and men uh, have to be altered. Uh, the uh, effects of uh, war and calamity on the health systems. War is the mother of all poverty. That's Andrea Riccardi, and you saw that firsthand. And then the connection between climate and public health. So those are three lessons that um, you offered before you were asked. Now, Mario and Roberto, uh, what is, is there a lesson from DREAM program that we can uh, uh, you know, s send out to the next generation for public health in Africa? Eh, Roberto, eh, qual è la lezione? Eh, you are, vuoi dire tu o ci pensi? Eh, you, you think about yes, it. Yes. No, no, the lesson of DREAM. <laughs> <laughs> We have to fight against uh, all the pessimism uh, about uh, the human being. Uh, uh, dream um, uh, fight uh, against uh, Afro-pessimism, but uh, today we have uh, to fight uh, against uh, hotel pessimism. Uh, war uh, is uh, a sort of pessimism. Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> The mission of of, uh, uh, of us uh, is uh, to to create a, a better world uh, uh, through our through, through uh, Christian optimism, uh, because uh, Christian are people of restoration and uh, are people of the future, not uh, of the past, uh, not uh, of the tragedy of the past. Uh, Sorry, I am perhaps uh, too general, but <laughs> the Not mission of a uh, dream is the uh, history of people who fought uh, uh, against uh, the, 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 the mal, the evil, the, the, I think. Uh, I'm perhaps a, a, a little rhetoric, but uh, I think uh, it is history, so... <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you, Roberto. And uh, I, I'm less deep than you are. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, one of the lessons of DREAM, now DREAM is um, a patrimony of Africa that has turned into, uh, as, the, as the subtitle says, uh, shaping the future of global health because all the dream centers, all the dream network has become, uh, well, a promotion of women um, uh, network. Uh, so it is uh, how to alter men and women relationships uh, into uh, health centers that start tackling uh, non-infectious diseases because Africa uh, is growing and growing and growing and has our problems. Uh, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and so on. So uh, when there was uh, in the most ac um, acute uh, time of the COVID crisis and pandemics, uh, all, the, all this network became awareness tools, uh, masks, uh, basic education, uh, and then also uh, the places where you could have the vaccine, uh, to be vaccinated for COVID. So this has become a backbone of a, of a model for public health in, uh, in uh, countries with low income. But uh, the, the main uh, lesson, I think, is that uh, stubbornness is also <laughs> to be faithful. So uh, all the many programs in Africa, uh, even liberal programs, are uh, the famous say, uh, don't give the fish, give the, the way to, to, to fish, to take the fish, no? Uh, or... Uh, we must be, we must promote, so we can give uh, money, but then they must be able to do by themselves and so on. But with AIDS, it's impossible, because 
once you start the therapy, you must go on for all your lifetime. This is terrible for us in fundraising because nobody wants to give money. Yes, one year, two years, three years. What's new this year? No, it's the same. <laughs> people get bored. Organizations get bored. Uh, companies will get bored. Rich people get bored. So <laughs> we must find again and again and again new donors. It's, it's not easy for something that is now much less trendy than in the past. But if we stop giving the therapy, they die. Now, the same that who lived. That's the problem. So to be faithful. And nothing is impossible. Uh, this is true. Uh, optimism. Christian optimism is not to deny reality. Uh, religious people, I think in every religious tradition, <coughs> at the very deep uh, of each religion, there is how to transform the heart of human beings, how to defeat evil. And evil is very strong in our times. We are not denying that there is evil, but we have to find out again the tools to uh, defeat or weaken evil. So I think it was impossible in Europe to imagine that French and German could have a meal together in 1946 in the home of a German of a, or a French after the war of 100 years, the war of 30 years, the First World War and the Second World War, and the Shoah. Well, and, and then Europe became Europe. Now we, we are in a movement of history that goes in the opposite direction. Fragmentation, nationalism, borders. But nothing is, in, is impossible. And at least we must start from ourselves some resistance. That's it. This is what I learned from Dream Program. We'd like to take some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, microphone is here, and is there one on that side also? Perfect. Uh, David? Thank you very much for your presentations. Could I ask uh, Professor Moroso de la Roca uh, how the San Egidio initiative in the DREAM program of stimulating willingness to move from prevention to therapy, how that move was related to what happened in this country, in the United States, with George W. Bush with the PEPFAR program, the, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which was very deeply committed to treatment of AIDS. And I just wondered what's the relationship of what San Egidio did and how it happened, how it interacted with what PEPFAR did and which came first and which influenced which. The, the important point is that uh, if uh, the patient becomes uh, therapies, the triple antiretroviral therapy, the virus uh, not uh, disappear, but uh, it, it, the, the people are no more uh, contagious. Contagious is end. And, but uh, this was uh, the why therapy is also prevention. I, I, the, bet, the best prevention. Uh, and PEPFAR? And PEPFAR. Uh, Sant'Egidio mm, received uh, money from uh, Global Fund, also from PEPFAR. PEPFAR helped Sant'Egidio. I think uh, PEPFAR were, uh, was, uh, I, I know, in the United States, uh, I read uh, um, uh, debate, uh, PEPFAR, uh, condom, uh, yes, condom not, but uh, this is not uh, the problem of Sant'Egidio, this uh, uh, art of uh, culture war uh, here. Uh, PEPFAR uh, gave uh, money uh, for uh, the uh, medicine, for, uh, for the antiretroviral. 
and uh, this was very important. Not only Pepper, but also Global Fund, also uh, Gates Foundation, uh, uh, other, uh, and also uh, European cooperation, uh, government, uh, also different uh, uh, entities. Uh, entities. But uh, Pepper was, uh, I think, important because uh, Pepper um, uh, gave uh, billions of dollars in around the world. It was very important. Sorry, when I don't know if more or less than a global fund, but uh, it, it was important. When he said billions, I, th I thought, to Santa Gidio, no. <laughs> 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 OK, some, some crumbles, yes, I'm right. Mm. So, I mean, Santa Gidio received from Pepfar, did San Egidio become did San Egidio become convinced about the importance of treatment because PEPFAR was already doing this? No. Or did, did San Egidio convince PEPFAR that treatment was a good uh, thing? I think I only, normally San Egidio needs a, a, a precise quantity of antiretroviral in a country. Uh, it is the country government uh, that uh, ask to PEPFAR, ask to Global Fund. It is uh, a round so, but the PEPFAR uh, gift. Just to, give, give, just to give. be simple, uh, Sant'Egidio started long before PEPFAR. Okay, that's what I was asking. Then, then uh, to, have the, to import, uh, to give drugs, the government, uh, under Sant'Egidio request, uh, asked PEPFAR, and at a certain point of this story, PEPFAR started to give m the money for the drugs, yes. So, but it is not that Sant'Egidio convinced to do PEPFAR. All the movement, all what we created year by year, started to convince part of the uh, scientific community, uh, global entities, and then also governments, and then arrived PEPFAR. Another question? Connected, connected. More or less. That's there. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Ken. I'm from Kenya. I worked with Michael Cheney, now Cardinal at African Jesuit AIDS Network. Um, I do agree with the idea of uh, drugs as really the issue or the thing that we need to put our effort in our attempt to try and deal with HIV and AIDS. But my question is accessibility and availability. Accessibility and, and availability. Yes. Um, I, the African situation, and I think you've tried to allude to that. When it comes to issues of health, it's a big problem. And I think for me, to, to get a sense of a presentation that tries to, to paint an image that it's easy for people, even people living with HIV and AIDS, to get treatment, to get drugs, whether for HIV and AIDS or malaria, I think it's probably not understanding the reality. I just came from working in South Sudan. People are dying, you know. And so I think what I want to ask is, from St. Egidio's point of view, from where you stand, is there hope for people living with HIV and AIDS uh, as far as accessibility to, accessibility to drugs uh, and, and therapy is concerned. And uh, so your question is crucial about accessibility and availability. One thing that has not come out this afternoon, but it is clear once you read the book, is that it was crucial in the dream approach was that everything was free of charge. And this made the program uh, suddenly crucial to invert, to, um, to turn uh, all the situation uh, and uh, give hope and life. Because uh, uh, when the British Journal or the Lancet uh, were studying the first uh, initiatives to test African people, they wrote African people do not come back to have the result of the test. So 
another reason not to start with therapy. But the problem is that nobody wanted to know in advance that would die a 20-year-old person that was already dead because there were no drugs accessible. Once we started the blood tests and to give for free, accessible, available in the right quantity, people started to come and wanted to know because this would mean that they and their kids would be alive. So this is a crucial point. So uh, for Africa, uh, for, for pandemics, yes, availability, accessibility, free of charge. That is, otherwise, it's impossible. But uh, this needed, a ta needed time. Only 2015, uh, the WHO published uh, a guideline uh, titled Test and Treat Together. But that uh, needed a time. Uh, uh, in the Sant'Egidio experience, uh, test and treat uh, Day one. were uh, one immediately. But uh, for uh, international uh, guidelines, uh, that needed more time. Today, test and treat uh, is uh, the, the, the law, the, 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 the rule. Huh? Then if it's in Sudan, they die because this is not uh, applied. Uh, this is that is not happening. The, and now in Sudan, they die, for, unfortunately, for many other reasons. It's terrible what happens in Sudan. Is there a last question? Father Sandberg? Uh, I'd like to know just what does it mean to be a member of the San Egidio <laughs> community? Because we talk about it, what it's doing and the programs and the, the hundreds of you know, people. What does it mean to be a member of it and are you members? Uh, um, the question is a very good question, but I have a better person here that can answer instead of me. Andrea. <laughs> Bancho mentioned me before. Um, I joined the community in 1970. The community was born in 1968. And we were 30 kids, a very small group. To be a member is just the same. Is, a, is an awareness that uh, the gospel can be lived and that the gospel is that source of hope that Roberto was mentioning before. The hope doesn't come from us, is not constructed by us, is received by grace because Jesus died and is risen and appears to a community. So the community is very simple. It was started by a person that was 18 when he started. Roberto joined when he was 17? 17. 17. Mario when he was 18. 18. We started all very young. And the idea is simply that the gospel speaks. And if you see anything around, you see, the me you see we have probably 15 people members. So you can also ask one, one, one by <laughs> one. And we have Caroline that is going to have a prayer tonight uh, at Copley Crypt. Because... Uh, we started asking people that were 14, 15, 16 to preach. And when we started in Rome, we were considered Protestant. Because we were going around with the with Bible and had lay people, women, preaching. This was ridiculous. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> but this was, uh, uh, Sant'Egidio is very much a post-Vatican to presence. Sant'Egidio was unthinkable bef before Vatican II. And uh, uh, Tom Banchov was mentioning before the prayer for peace. We were just very touched by Wojtyla's uh, prayer in Assisi in 86. 86, everybody needs to remember that was before the fall of Berlin Wall, before the end of the Soviet Union. And all religions coming together, we have a wonderful testimony here, 
uh, of, uh, of that uh, moment. And we really need to wonder what is the spirit asking us today? Where everything is against, everything is hostile, everything is, is one against the other. Sant'Egidio, as Roberto mentioned, as Mario mentioned, is very much captured by this idea that the gospel lives and gives life and calls us to life. And uh, if I may add one thing, no, add, just to mm, say the same things with other words. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Paul, Eli, uh, at the very beginning of this meeting said, I understood through being with Sant'Egidio people the meaning of the word friendship. And some, uh, friendship is another way of saying what Sant'Egidio is. Then how to be Sant'Egidio, like you can start to be friend with another person with Sant'Egidio. This is a way of starting. Uh, there is not a document that says you are Sant'Egidio. It is friendship. Because we are not just an organization, we are sort of a family of families, not only of married people among themselves. If you are my friend, you are my family. If the poor are my friends, are my family. So uh, Pope Francis says Sant'Egidio is three P. Peace, poor, and prayer. Uh, I would say Sant'Egidio is uh, uh, the gospel, or the Bible, friendship, and the poor. And not to give up the need to change the world by using weak means, not power. Uh, in the church, Sant'Egidio Church in Rome, we, our name comes from that place. Uh, it's in the Trastevere neighborhood uh, uh, in Rome. There is a, a cross, a crucifix, a wooden crucifix, without the cross because it is ancient and broken and without arms. We call it uh, Christ of impotence or Christ of weakness. And somehow we have to, do, to be the, the arms of Jesus. And how to, to change the world by using weak means, with tools, but through friendship. So I would say, how to become a member? Start talking to some of them. <laughs> and start talking to some other, other people, because we should try to be at least two. That is the beginning of the word community. That is also a dream for the world. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Catherine. I know I'm, I'll leave emboldened and invigorated by this. Uh, I, I, it never fails to hear what, what, what the movement does, and um, it's, it's so powerful, so thank you. And more information about the book is uh, in circulation, and it'll be off press and in stores uh, and on the internet anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you for being here.